time and whilst people are joining, I might make a start. And um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the, of the land on which we all meet today and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And I'd like to extend that um, respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples that may be joining us um, here today. So my name is Christine Zarin. I'm one of the co-founders and directors of the White Coats Foundation. Um, and for those of you who are new um, to the White Coats Foundation, just very briefly, we are a not-for-profit charity that was established in recognition of the need to raise awareness about the role of clinical trials in advancing medical science and healthcare. And we have a variety of initiatives that um, are designed to help us achieve this goal. Um, and these initiatives target the general public, um, patients and carers and the healthcare professional community because we know there are knowledge gaps that exist within each of those groups. Um, there are five core arms that are aligned with our charitable, charitable purpose. We have a research arm, education and resources arm, fundraising arm, events arm and an, and a merchandise arm. And actually today's session has been prompted um, by an idea we had as part of our research arm, um, which was to develop um, and and well, pilot and the development and implementation of a standardised survey um, that sites around Australia could use to routinely collect feedback on the participant experience in research. And in the process, we discovered that there were um, a lot of sites taking on the initiative of developing their own um, survey for this exact purpose. So we thought it was probably a good idea to pause on our plans um, and to stop and, and just ask more questions and primarily um, to determine, you know, is a, a national standardised survey tool something that the sector wants? Um, is this something that would be welcomed by, by patients and, and sites? And if it is valued, how do we harmonise efforts to collect data that will help build a national picture on the patient voice and participant experience in research? Um, now, clearly, you know, with an undertaking like that, there are multiple stakeholders that need to be involved and um, lots of collaboration in quite, uh, required. Um, the value proposition um, needs to be clear. So for, for you know, patients taking time to complete a survey like that and for sites taking time to administer a survey of that nature, um, they, need, they need to be confident that the, the outcomes of that survey are going to be translated into meaningful outcomes. And, of course, um, responsibility of stewardship. Yeah, uh, where does this sit? People need to feel confident about where they're going to be placing their trust. Um, so we thank you for joining us today as we explore different appro approaches to potentially using surveys as a way of capturing the patient voice in research. And we have some fabulous presenters and panellists joining us today with lots of experience um, to help us with this topic. And I will be um, um, introducing them in turn as we progress throughout the session um, this afternoon or this morning. Um, but before we do go any further, um, I, I just want to make a couple of quick introductions. So um, firstly, Elizabeth Wilson, who will be co-facilitating the session with me today. And I did say to Liz I was going to hand over to her so she can introduce herself, but I do just want to mention that um, Liz is Director of Prime and Partner Sites at IQV, and she's also a valued member of the White Coats Foundation Advisory Board and she has over 25 years experience um, in the hospital pharmacy and drug development sector. And in her current role, she leads IQV's clinical research relationships with clinical research organisations and hospitals. So I'm sure that her experience engaging with site leaders is going to lend itself really well to today's discussion. So Liz, I'll pass over to you so you can say a hello and, and, and introduce yourself. Hello to everyone and um, thanks for joining. So yes, I'm Liz Wilson and um, I have been around way too long and um, my best friend is a plastic surgeon here at the Gold Coast. So <laughs> got to keep that as you age. Um, but my background is a hospital pharmacist in, um, and that's where I started clinical trials in um, oncology and haematology, so cancer patients. And since then, then I've worked in a couple of uh, Australian biotech companies developing drugs 
and now um, since 2009 at IQVIA, which is a clinical research organisation where my role is really um, supporting our hospitals and our sites and our research staff to make sure that the trials run successfully for all of our patients. So I'm looking forward to today. I think it's a really good topic. Mm, thank you so much, Liz. And um, I also just want to um, in, acknowledge and introduce you to my co-founder and um, colleague and director of White Coats Foundation, Fiona Cameron. She's always on hand to make sure everything's running smoothly, technically, and to make sure events like this are possible. And to Michelle DeVito-Smith, um, who's head of patient experience and stakeholder engagement at White Coats Foundation. Um, Michelle's going to be monitoring the Q&A channel today for us. The, the chat function has been disabled, so please direct any of your questions or comments into the Q&A and Michelle will be um, either answering those live or bringing them into the um, panel discussion in Q&A time we have reserved for after the presentation, so at the end of this session. Um, so before I introduce our first uh, speaker for today, I just we just want to bring up a quick poll to get a rough idea of how people feel about um, surveys to routinely collect the participant experience in research and particularly whether there may be a preference for a standardised approach or if people think that um, it's better to allow sites to manage this independently or maybe you think neither, maybe there's another, another solution. So um, Fiona, if you could bring up the poll, that would be fantastic. So hopefully everybody can see that on their screen now. Um, and we're just gonna give everyone a couple minutes to answer the, the there's two questions. And we will be running the same poll at the end of the session as well, just to see if there's any changes in how people feel after hearing today's presentations. <clears throat> so, so then clearly most people at this point feel that there sh we should be looking at adopting a, um, a standardised approach to collecting um feedback on the participant experience in research. Some people feel that cl clinical trial sites should take responsibility for um, developing their their own surveys. And, and, I'm, and I'm really glad to see, um, you know, this difference of opinion because that's why we're here today. And it'll be really interesting to possibly hear from, um, you know, people that think that sites should be taking on this responsibility independently. It'd be really great to hear from you later in the um in the QA session as to why you know you think that's preferable as opposed to adopting a standardized approach. Anyhow, um we'll stop sharing those results now and um I introduce you to our first speaker of the afternoon. So, Mana, I'm really excited to introduce you. Um, Mana Gorsorki is going to talk to us about the participant experience in research survey that has been conducted annually by the NIHR Clinical Research um, Network since 2015-16. Um, over in the UK. So Manna is the Public Engagement Manager at the National Institute for Healthcare Research, NIHR, um, Research Delivery Network Coordinate, Coordinating Centre in the UK. And in this role, she oversees the day-to-day -day delivery of the uh, Participant in Research Experience Survey, or PRES for short, across the Research Delivery Network. Um, and she works with NH NHS delivery organisations throughout England. There's too many acronyms for me, this, and it's too early in the morning to say half of these. Um, so I'm very excited to learn more about how PRES came about, how it's working to support um, solutions to challenges seen in trials that may be faced by patients and how the outcomes of that survey are working to promote research that's more accessible and more participant-centred for volunteers and patients. So. Thank you so much for joining us, Mana, um, and I'll, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you, Christine. Um, can you hear me very well? Okay, good. Yes. Great. Um, good morning from UK. Uh, 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 thank you so much for inviting me to join into your webinar, uh, Christine and Fiona. Uh, I'm excited to be here and share some of the experience we have been gathering throughout PRES 
apologies in advance with all the abbreviation. <laughs> um, uh, so I will be referring to Prez. Um, so uh, I'm just going to share my screen. So hopefully uh, you can see my screen now. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so yes, um, my name is Mana Golsorki. I'm the public engagement manager at National Institute for Health Research Research Delivery Network. Um, so uh, I've been involved in press um, since the pilot stage. Uh, I'm going to give you some like background information and what we have done on press over the last few years. So we have tried both localized and national versions. So hopefully some of the learning we have um, gained over the last few years is going to help you to make a decision what is best uh, for you. So um, a bit of background about National Institute for Health Research. We are an uh, organization funded by Department of Health in England. We have different coordinating centers where I am based is the research delivery network. Uh, we have been through transition um, recently. So previously we were known as clinical research network coordinating center. And more recently it's research delivery network um, uh, shortened as like RDN. So we are basically the research delivery arm of the NHS. So our responsibility and our mission is making sure that we provide uh, research opportunity across different NH setting and more recently outside NHS setting. So our focus is shifting as well um, over the next few years. Um, and uh, it's just making sure that we provide uh, the participants the opportunity to take part in research and research is part of their uh, like a normal um, care pathway. Uh, how we are operating, so we are a coordinating center, but how we are working, it's um, through our local regional network. So previously it was 15 LCRN. So I will be referring to LCRNs throughout my presentation, but from 1st of October this year, they've been transitioned to regional research delivery network. So basically they are responsible on our behalf to deliver different program, programs and projects, including PRES. Um, uh, a bit of background about PRES. So I will be referring to PRES as well throughout the slide sets and presentation. So it is participant in research experience survey. What it is, it is basically a survey to measure the experience of research participants uh, uh, throughout their research studies. Um, why we do why do we deliver press um, we think that it's really important to give this opportunity to participants to share their experience and feedback they've given us time to take part in clinical research and i think this is the minimum we can ask them how they felt about it and it's going to be their their feedback it's going to be the center of the work that we do on day to day basis and it's really imp um, uh, important tool in terms of um, improving the retention and recruitment throughout our research cycle how do we deliver press? Uh, so we have two options in, in England to offer press to participants. Either it's like an online platform or a paper copy. So they have the opportunity to complete either of those um, to, like a versions, whether at the site when they are waiting for, I don't know, their treatment or appointments, or they can take it home and complete it. The paper copies can be sent back and completed uh, with the, to the data processor company. Um, where we started with press, so originally the first uh, press was delivered back in 2015-16, and it was only three of our local networks they managed to deliver press uh, locally, and we had a set of like a booklet question set at the time. Um, gradually, as we wanted to get uh, more of our local networks out of 15, um, so we, ha we had to shift the focus. So it wasn't like a, the whole question set. So we were focusing on number of question sets, very minimum um, throughout the year. So from three LCRNs, we managed to get to seven local networks. And eventually in 2018-19, we managed to get all of our local networks on board to deliver press. So it means that there it was at least one NHS organization in that local network to deliver press. So it didn't mean that all of them, they are delivering press. Um, at the time, we were looking at only like three national question sets. So it was two rating scale question and one free text. Uh, and there were a number of versions going around locally. They developed because they felt that it's like a children version is needed or like aphasia or cardiovascular. So for we had like about 10, 15 local versions going around at the same time. 
Um, in 2019-20, PRIS become our high-level objective, so, uh, which means that it was one of our primary performance indicator. We were required to report back to Department of Health on a quarterly basis. Up to then, when we were collecting PRES, we were gathering information from our local colleagues at the end of each financial year. So by the time we were receiving her press data, it was kind of a year old, so we could act on that. But as became like a HLO, we had to report back on a quarterly basis. Around the same time, we uh, formed the National Press Advisory Group. So this is a group of uh, very experienced individuals who have been involved in press, including our local PPI leads, a uh, number of the patient and uh, public members, and um, the research delivery staff who were handing out press at the local level so we could get like a first-hand feedback from them how it's performing. And the group, it's been really instrumental in terms of all the changes and development we have done over the years on PRES. In 2020 and 2021, we uh, went to finalize a set of national question set. As um, COVID hit, we had the set of national question set delivering across all of 15 networks. So there was no localized version, the only acceptable version. It was one adult version that we were handing out. And uh, more recently, we developed a national dashboard to display the data so we can drill down because we are collecting site and a study ID from all the individuals who are completing press savers. So we are able to drill down all the data who has completed where and what was the experience. So uh, that's the most recent development on press. Why we decided to have a standardized question set. Um, I think at the beginning, it was really important to get every everybody on board. So we were flexible in terms of localized version. Uh, but as you know, that it takes time to make any changes. Uh, and we were, by the time we were receiving the feedback, as I said, it was one year old. If we want to produce the report, making the recommendations and do any continuous improvement, we were up to the next financial year and delivering the new kind of question set or the focus. So there was no time for continuous improvement. Um, we didn't have time to, uh, we, we, we were not able to do like a year by year comparison because it was just limited number of the evidence. If there was like a different question set, there was no way that we could do that comparison and we couldn't make any recommendations at a strategic level because we just didn't have enough um evidence or number of like a surveys to make any decision. And it was just too many versions going around and too time consuming. So that's why we came to the decision to develop a set of national question set. Um, so benefit of the national standardized question sets um, set since 2020 for us. Uh, so as I said, it enabled us to make a comparison between the studies. So for example, how one particular study is performing specifically at one side and compare it to the other side. So uh, we can do that. Uh, we can make an informed decision. We can make it like a year by year comparison uh, and do like a continuous improvement. Um, so because it takes time to make any changes. So uh, with the more evidence and more data, we could be able to do that. Uh, I would say one of the benefits that we had during like a COVID time, um, we were worried that we have like a drop in the number of press responses because there was nobody coming to like a sites to complete research but I think at the beginning we had a drop but eventually it took up so we had the most responses during that time to our like urgent public health studies and vaccine studies uh, um, as we were reporting back on a quarterly basis we were able to uh, follow up with the negative comments so if there was a lot for example negative comments around one particular study we were able to report it back to the study team kind of real time so they could make any changes so I think that's the whole purpose of the press to be able to make changes and improve the um, service um, to our participants and at the moment press is just as a, like a business as usual for our local networks and research delivery teams so they they need to offer that um, to every participants um, uh, what we have found um, over the last six years, so we just produced our, uh, published the uh, report from last financial year. I'm not going to go through this. Uh, I can share the report later at the link to the most recent report later, but uh, it just shows the number of responses we have achieved. So we have a good source of like a, a strong evidence uh, about what participants tell us, what is important for them to make it like a positive um 
experience in terms of like, for example, accessibility, just making sure that we offer research to everybody, no matter where they live, what's their background. Um, some of the practicalities in terms of like when they attend a, uh, like a clinical visit, um, what's the car park? whether there's a, like a refreshment, how easy to access. I don't know, for example, if there is a, like an app, whether they can contact somebody if they have any question about their, um, like for example, appointment. So these are the things that it makes a difference for, for participants um, to have a positive experience. And what we developed so far, um, I think since we focused on the national standardized question set, it, sh it freed up some time and space for us at the national level and both local level to focus on like a quality improvement and continuous improvement and making sure that we uh, develop enough um, resources and tools for our research delivery staff to deliver press. Um, so at the national level, we developed the PRES microsite, which is like a one-stop shop to have all the information about delivering PRES. They have like a set of question set and tools uh, and local colleagues when they produce, for example, documents and resources, they share it with us. So we include all of those information in one place. Um, again, we, we've been, been able to use um, the resources from the local level, one of our local um, networks, they, they develop a delivery module. So basically explain what is press, how it needs to be delivered. So we managed to use that module, online module, and scale it up at the national level. So this is open for, for everybody who wants to deliver press in our local um, area. Some of them, they use it as a part of their induction and onboarding for the new staff, So which is, uh, which is great. Um, uh, one other thing I think it's been really important as we were increasing the number of press responses year by year, the quality of data we were collecting, it was really important. I wouldn't say that we were getting the best quality data where we were collecting at the earliest stages in terms of like a duplicate missing information. So at the moment, um, our BI colleagues developed number of templates across all of our networks. So if there is any submission that doesn't meet the requirement, it's just going to be flagged straight away. So we make sure that the data we are collecting, it has all the information we need. Um, as I said, we developed a national press dashboard to collect the data and all of our networks now have a sort of digital platform to collect the information, online survey, and also to display data to their um, local colleagues. Um, uh, I would say one of the best things we have achieved over the last nine years, it's just a great working relationship we developed uh, with our local colleagues because it just uh, made to use the resources we have, which is not a lot um, in the best way in terms of, for example, they were producing like a video online module. So they were able to share it uh, with other colleagues. And because it was a set of national question sets, so when we were referring, there was no localized version. So the resources could be used across the network um, throughout the year. Um, and one final thing for us for the next step. So as we have been collecting press over the last few years, um, uh, we are going to review our question set uh, because we've been receiving number of comments and feedback from our participants. Um, research is delivered outside NHS setting, whether those question set fits different settings. So these are the things we are considering at the moment, and we are working closely with our press advisory group to review this question set. Um, and one other thing is that one of our networks, they are fully digital. Uh, so they developed a fully accessible uh, digital platform to collect this uh, press responses. So we are in talk with that specific network to adopt that um, platform at the national level. We are not going to be fully digital at the national level because that's not accessible. But uh, again, in terms of like streamlining what we are offering to the patients in terms of uh, um, accessibility and um, the quality of the service we are offering. We think that that's one of the best way to offer press to them. So that's where we are and we are hoping to achieve this uh, before end of, by the end of this financial year. And yeah, that's me. Thank you for listening. Well, um, survey goals right there. It's a fantastic example of what can be achieved when people collaborate. Um, and I have so many questions, which I think we'll try and reserve for the panel discussion and Q&A that, that we've got reserved at the end of the session. But um was so impressed to hear about how the survey is being used to provide real-time feedback. Um, you don't really think about surveys 
you know, in that way. You always think about collecting data later, but how you're using it to impact um, the experience real time is is amazing. Um, so yeah, lots of questions as I'm sure you, Liz, too, probably have, and um, our, our attendees today. So we look forward to talking to you in more detail mm -hmm. about um, Prez later on, Manna. Um, so, but but right now, I think we'll um, go um, to our next speaker, Sarah. Liz, did you want to introduce Sarah? Sure. Before I do, just it's interesting with the University of the Sunshine Coast Clinical Trial Centre. So in 2015, I sat at the university in, in a hot room in a desk with Lucas Latifka, who's the, the head of the US um, CCTC, didn't have a centre, didn't have a trial unit, had nothing but a university who wanted to do something. And we sat there together and he formed an advisory board. And now the USC CTC does um, so many trials, has multiple centres, maybe four centres now. Um, so what a great, um, what a great story. But Sarah is the regulatory startup and patient partnerships manager at the University of the Sunshine Coast Clinical Trial Centre in Queensland. Uh, Sarah provides high level strategic advice and guidance in the management and compliance of extensive and complex ethics and regulatory processes, which we all know about, and functions as a subject matter expert for consumer and community involvement. So um, why she's here today. In 2019 as well, not just to sort of uh, promote her anymore, Sarah was awarded the Osmond Russell Scholarship from ARCS for a project that had seen her research and validate a patient co-authored survey to solicit regular and meaningful feedback from clinical um, trial participants. So there's a site doing it on their own. Um, and Sarah is very passionate about advocating for patients. Um, so welcome, Sarah, and look forward to your discussion. Sorry, had to work out my technology there, needed to unmute. Thank you, Liz. And um, it's great to hear those stories about um, the inception of UniSC clinical trials. Uh, thank you, Mana, for that talk. Um, it's really um, aspirational and certainly something that we can take a leaf out of your book um, locally um, to uh, work a work out a way that we can have standardized data that we can um, use to answer important research questions, improve our clinical trial service delivery, and um, it's all about the patients. So um, thank you for that. And um, I'll, without further ado, I'll share my screen. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, Fiona, Michelle and Christine um, to share our unique approach to participant experience surveys. Um, as Liz mentioned, I'm from the University of the Sunshine Coast Clinical Trials and at UniSC we've taken the approach of adapting existing scales to create an instrument that's specifically designed to capture the clinical trial patient experience. So today I'll be sharing with you our motivations for collecting participant feedback, the steps that we've taken to do it well and how we can use participant feedback to its full potential and, and the challenges we face as we scale this approach. So hopefully we're all here because we already know that patients and families have a unique perspective, the lived experience of their condition. And so consulting with consumers early, often and meaningfully can ensure that products and research endpoints are relevant and align with patient needs and priorities. We know we have a moral and ethical imperative to consult with consumers and consistent with this, the regulators and payers, both locally and internationally, are pushing us to involve consumers in a systematic and structured way in medicines development. So one of the reasons we're all here, the National Clinical Trials Governance Framework User Guide recognises that the importance of consumer involvement at the health service provider or the clinical trial site level, placing partnering with consumers and several associated actions as a central component of the framework. As such, one of the prescribed actions to support safe and high quality clinical trial service provision involves the systematic solicitation of feedback from clinical trials participants, their carers and their families via well-designed and validated data collection tools. Australian clinical trial sites need a low resource, high impact solution to inject the participant voice into their clinical trial conduct and to comply with the national clinical trials governance standards. 
So what does the current landscape look like locally and internationally? You've just heard about the Participant Experience and Research Survey, where every year in the UK, the NHR, NIHR Clinical Research Network asks thousands of research participants to share their experiences of taking part in research and aggregates the data to answer important research questions. Transcelerate have cross-culturally validated an open access patient experience survey, originally developed in the oncology space, but then cross-culturally validated um, to other indications and in non-English speaking countries, known as the Study Participant Feedback Questionnaire or the SPFQ. And it collects comprehensive feedback about clinical trial participant experience, including both elements within the purview of the sponsor, such as design and procedures, and of the clinical trial site, such as the answering of questions and attitudes of staff. The Australian Hospital's patient experience questions set has been developed robustly with focus groups to provide nationally consistent measurement of the experiences of patients admitted to hospital and day surgery clinics. And there has been published evidence by UCB Pharma on best practice for the development and deployment of patient experience surveys. At UniSC Clinical Trials, we aim to co-create with consumers a validated participant experience survey, which offers participants a voice and offers trial sites real-time meaningful feedback on their performance. We've called it the Participant Voice Survey or PVS. In contrast to other participant uh, experience surveys, the PVS focuses specifically on elements of clinical trial service delivery that can be affected primarily by the clinical trial site. So not the protocol or the design, but things like the administration, the staff, the facilities, um, the physical space and the digital space. To our knowledge, this is the first Australian co-created validated survey measuring clinical trial site performance as perceived by the participant. The consumer involvement is multi-layered. The survey has been co-created with participants and it also provides clinical trial, oh, sorry, yeah, it also could, could, uh, provides clinical trial sites a means to involve participant feedback during and after the clinical trial conduct. In addition to providing trial sites with a feedback instrument, it is hoped the data from the feedback surveys can be analysed to answer important clinical trials research questions. For example, it can be hypothesised that participant rapport will have an impact on participants advocating to others to participate. So we took a cross-functional and multi-staged approach to develop and test the participant experience survey instrument. Our work started back in 2019 and in the midst of the COVID pandemic, we modified our plans to have a focus group session with our participants to have one-on-one -on -one sessions with them in order to help us create the survey. A working group of clinical research professionals at UniSC created a first draft of the survey. Um, they did this after consulting patient views 12 indicators of the reputation of pharma. And then consumer advisory sessions with clinical trial participants provided general insights on the participant trial experience. Key concepts of importance to measure and a refined first draft of the survey. To expand a bit on the consumer advisory activity, Consumer advisors were diverse in gender and age. Ages ranged from 24 to 74. End trial indication, we had patients from um, studies for anti-wrinkle injections, celiac, hypertriglyceridemia, osteoarthritis and pterygium, as well as a healthy elderly study for prevention of respiratory illness. Consumer advisors were provided with self-training materials to prepare for their focus session and consumer advisors met with one or two facilitators and one scribe. The one hour session was divided into uh, approximately 30 minutes of um, open-ended questions about their trials experience and then about 30 minutes of workshopping the survey. And from this, we, from this activity, we got some rich insights into the consumer experience, which I'll take a, bit, uh, take a moment here to share a bit with you. So we asked consumer advisors, what were your motivations for joining a clinical trial? Consumer advisors were hopeful that the study drug would work and that they and future gener generations would benefit from um, the experience. One consumer advisor who has participated on a celiac trial expressed that he had realistic expectations, but also hoped for a breakthrough cure. They also had altruistic motivations. Quote, if someone doesn't trial the drugs, they won't get onto the market. 
So while they were, of course, hopeful they would be assigned to the treatment arm, they were accepting of placebo. Uh, we asked, did you have any hesitations in joining a clinical trial? What were they and why? Most consumers advised us that they had no hesitations. Quote, I trust the process. And quote, hopefully you have to go through a few loopholes before you uh, the trial gets approved. They said they trusted the reputation of the university, the sponsor, described as a large reputable company, and the Human Research Ethics Committee. And two consumer advisors recounted the negative reactions of skeptical friends at their intention to participate in a trial. But to this, they said, quote, any drugs you take can have side effects and someone has to do it. Again, the altruistic values came through. We asked, what benefits did you receive that you were not expecting, if any? And importantly, some participants commented on how being in, on a clinical trial made them pay more attention to their health. One said she had screen failed a trial previously at a trial site in Brisbane. But although that was disappointing, of course, the benefit was that the test that she had made her realise the extent and severity of her celiac disease. Some patients expressed their delight that they were seemingly on the active drug arm, quote, and it worked. My cholesterol went down so far and so fast. Quite amazing. It was a good result. And that's from a patient on a hypertriglyceridemia trial. Uh, one pa patient remarked at how incidental findings were handled, quote, the study doctor told me I need to go to my GP and now I'm having my gallbladder out. Again, patients enjoyed the altruistic value of participating in a trial, quote, it's good to be a part in some small way of contributing to a bigger thing. And we asked, what negative impacts did your trials experience elicit, if any? Most participants' immediate reaction was that there were no negatives. And then on reflection, one participant mentioned chalky food supplements, the size of the tablets and, quote, the number I had to swallow a day. And others mentioned burdensome technology, such as apps for diary and ePro that didn't work as they should, which probably doesn't come as a surprise to most of us. So overwhelmingly of note, the activity highlighted that participants valued the rapport they had with the investigators and staff. This made them feel safe and at ease. And participants enjoyed many benefits from participating in a trial, including improvements in their condition, close medical follow-up follow -up and reimbursement. However, participants stressed the value of the feeling of altruism they got from participating. So following the consumer advisory sessions and now having a co-created draft of the survey, we partnered with two of our university marketing academics to adopt a health services marketing approach. Prior research indicates that services marketing significantly contributes to the understanding and management of healthcare service experiences. And notably, studies demonstrate that when a customer-centric approach is applied in healthcare, it leads to heightened satisfaction levels, improved health outcomes, and increased commitment to health-related behaviours. Using the drafted instrument and the definitions of the domains, they developed a model of the USC clinical trials participant experience. And together we drafted a survey for pilot to be delivered at three key time points. The survey was delivered via um, online via Qualtrics, accessed by a link text message to the participant's smartphone. And participants were recruited from UniSC clinical trials as they enrolled into trials prospectively. Informed consent is provided via the first page of the survey and participants provided their email not to be used as an identifier, but as a way of linking a participant's responses across the three time points. We received ethical approval from the University of the Sunshine Coast Human Research Ethics Committee, 3rd of December, 2021, and the pilot launched with the first survey sent out on 6th of April, 2022. Pilot enrollment completed in April 2023, and that included 15 months of enrollment at a single site, plus one month of enrollment where an additional UniSC site was added to complete the numbers needed for statistical power. In total, there were 218 respondents to the Time Point One survey, and of those, 76% of participants completed the survey in full. Respondents were healthy volunteers or patients on clinical trials researching interventions in a range of indications, including influenza vaccines, COVID vaccines, um, combination and novel vaccine delivery methods, myopia, hypertriglyceridemia, low density lipoprotein cholesterol, psoriasis, obesity, and cognitive impairment due to depressive disorder. 
respondents were diverse in age, gender, life status and education. Uh, the analysis included reliability tests to ensure that the items were reliable indicators of the constructs we intended to measure in relation to the patient's voice. And regression tests were also conducted to explore relationships between the independent and dependent constructs, like the relationship between rapport and advocacy that I mentioned earlier that can be tested. So the analysis wrapped up this year and the results of the validation and testing of a hypothesis using the instrument have been drafted into a publication, which is currently under review. So just emphasising the time and manpower this has taken, where if you recall, I mentioned that the consumer advisory began in 2019, uh, sorry, in COVID-19, so in 2020, and um, we've only wrapped up the analysis this year. Um, it does take quite a bit more time than we, than certainly we appreciated when we set out to do it. So from the analysis, we ended up with two versions of the survey, um, which will have different uses. The short form survey contains single item measures, a bit like most marketing surveys that you receive if you shopped at Fantastic Furniture or at Pizza Hut and you get a um, text message afterwards and you get a, a quick 10 questions. Um, and so those are single item measures to look at the registration, oh, sorry, they're the single item measures. Um, and for example, one to look at the registration process would look like this. So I was able to register without help, before my clinical trial without help. And you can see here the four points which the consumer could choose from to give us an indication about that experience. This is good for face value feedback for the site, but if we want more reliability and validity, the long form or multi-scale, multi-item scale version is going to be better. And particularly what we want this reliability and validity for those research questions. So an example for the same thing that we're looking to measure the registration process, the appropriate item scale contains these three questions, which are basically measuring the same thing. I was able to register without help. The process of registration was efficient. I think it was easy to res register. This guarantees us that any misinterpretations of the question won't lead to inconsistencies in how the experience is reported. To expand a bit on that, you can probably ascertain already that there are benefits and drawbacks with both multi-item scales and single item measures. It's great to have more reliability and validity, but in reality, we're more likely to get more responses if our surveys are short and snappy. And so with multi-item scales, the benefits include greater reliability, reducing the influence of random error, increased validity, offering a more nuanced understanding of patient experience, sensitivity to changes, valuable for tracking the impact of interventions or improvements. And then problems obviously are respondent burden as they're more time consuming and mentally taxing. This could lead to lower response rates or incomplete responses. Uh, complexity of scoring and interpreting multi-scale items is higher. Um, it's something that needs proper statistical validation and probably can't be um, analyzed at a site level. Item redundancy, some items may overlap or be perceived as redundant, which can cause frustration and disengagement for the respondent. And then for single item measures, the benefits are obviously the opposite. Simplicity and speed leading to higher response rates and lower dropout. They're practical, straightforward measures to administer and interpret. And they direct focus. A well-designed single item measure can capture a focused overall impression, which may be all that is needed um, in certain situations. Um, Whereas the problems include lower reliability because they don't account for uh, potential random error or variability in how patients interpret the question. There's limited scope. A single item measure cannot capture the full complexity of patient experience, meaning important dimensions such as communication or wait times may be overlooked. And single item measures may not be sensitive enough to detect small but significant changes in patient experience, which can make it harder to track progress over time. And of course, risk of misinterpretation. Patients may interpret a single item question differently, leading to inconsistencies. So having the two versions, long and short form, allows us to use both for varying situations as we weigh up these benefits and drawbacks. So where to next? We would love to roll this out, but there are challenges in finding a platform that is automated 
We don't want to add burden to site teams who are already stretched and also a platform that is available to all sites, open access or at a reasonable price. And it was interesting to see that's also a challenge for Prez, finding a digital platform that's suitable. Um, the other thing I'd mentioned too is uh, how it interacts with the clinical trial management system because we want to make it automated with the patient schedule, visit schedule. Um, it would be amazing if we could have aggregated and rich national data that helps us to answer important questions about our operations and service delivery, recruitment and retention and quality. And with that, I'll just acknowledge um, our patient partners who co-created the draft survey, as well as uh, as well, we thank all our clinical trials participants have responded to the pilot survey. We value and respect your opinions and the important role you play in medicine's development. Um, I'll also acknowledge our two marketing academics, Associate Professor Rory Mulcahy and Dr. David Fleishman. Um, the bulk of this work has been funded by the University of the Sunshine Coast, but as mentioned as well, ARCS um, provided me with a grant with the Osmond Russell Scholarship. And this is my speaker information. I'd be very happy to hear from um, any of the attendees that have further questions or further ideas of how we can roll this out. And thank you for your time. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for um, sharing your journey with us in developing that survey. Um, <clears throat> Again, I, I'm really glad that you mentioned the National Clinical Trials Governance Framework and Standard too, because we wondered that, you know, this increased um, initiative that we're seeing by sites in wanting to develop their own surveys, how much of that is probably being driven by um, them wanting to meet, you know, require, requirements under the new accreditation framework. Um, and I'm, I'm also wondering for anyone who's attending today that's a site representative, how they're feeling about developing their own survey now, just seeing the amount of work involved in, you know, achieving what you have achieved. Um, obviously, you know, resources vary across sites and you've, you've got a lot of resources at your disposal and, um, you know, great, great work. Lots of questions again, but um, since we are talking about collecting the patient voice through surveys, we thought it was only appropriate to have um, co consumers participate in the discussion today. And so we've invited um, Shyam Sundar, Muthra Malingam and Sarah Lukeman um, to give us their perspective and their views on surveys to collect the patient voice in research um, and particularly to, to share their views on whether we should be looking at adopting a national approach, national standardised approach, or whether um, we should be looking, whether sites should be, you know, taking on this responsibility independently. Um, so, Shyam, I'm going to introduce you first. Um, so, Dr. Shyam Sundamuthra Malingam um, has a PhD in chemistry. He is a kidney transplant recipient and passionate advocate for consumer engagement in healthcare research. Um, drawing from personal experience with hemodialysis and kidney disease, Shyam collaborates with leading organisations like ANS Data, SAMRI, the George Institute and Kidney Health Australia. He represents the community voice on the National Clinical Advisory Committee at KHA and the Australian Medical Council, contributing to the accreditation of medical degrees. Shyam's leadership fosters collaboration between researchers and consumers, ensuring that research aligns with patient needs and experiences. And we have Sarah Lukeman, um, patient perspective partner joining us today. And Sarah is um, a cancer survivor. She's a clinical trial participant and experienced health consumer advocate and representative. Um, she's actually trained as a chemical engineer. She's worked in the mining industry. And she was actually elected to local government in 2016 to 21. And she's also a Tai Chi instructor. Um, she lives in regional New South Wales and advocates for equitable access to health care um, and a just transition for mining communities. So Sarah shares her lived experience with several discovery science cancer research teams, including associate investigators on grants, and she's um, been a co-author on publications. Um, she has a very long bio. Um, she <laughs> lots of experience. Um, 
And Sarah is regularly invited to speak on consumer involvement in research and has presented at conferences for ARCS, SCRS, and the Trans-Tasman Radiation Oncology Group. And she's also joined the CTI community, CTIQ Steering Committee um, and worked on the INFORM project in 2021 and the Beyond the, the FORM project at its inception and recently featured in the Balberry podcast with other health consumers. Um, she's also on the board of Cancer Council New South Wales and was, and was on the executive of Cancer Voices New South Wales for six years. Um, so thank you both Shyam and Sarah for joining us today. Um, I look forward to having heard both of these presentations now um, and seeing the results of the poll. I'm very keen for your, your feedback on how you think and feel about this topic. Sharon, maybe we can start with you and then move across to Sarah because I know, um, just so everyone knows, Sarah's feeling a little bit under the weather today, but she's um, she's a trooper. She's made the effort to still join um, the, the, the discussion on this really important topic today. And Sharon, just before you, you start, I think... Both speakers, Mana and Sarah, mentioned validation. And when we look at setting up these questionnaires and surveys, that's a really important point is around how do you validate? So if a site does something on its own, that important piece of validation is um, is going to be crucial to success, I think. Thanks, Christina. And um, thanks, White, White Courts Foundation as well to um, invite patient perspective of course it's a patient experience so it's prudent to invite people um like me and sarah are uh, in this conversation i think um we all know that uh, saying what gets measured gets managed i think surveys are, can drive change but only if it's thoughtfully designed and used beyond as a tick box exercise because uh, people are often frustrated with too many surveys. Uh, I personally involved in a lot of surveys like patient reported experience measures, patient reported outcome measures, but we need to build trust with the participants, but by showing that their input can lead to a change because there is this importance of closing the loop by sharing the survey results. And um, that's really important because often these are in a siloed environment where these results are sh shared, not often shared with the participants. And what we need is um, a survey that can not only go beyond recruiting participants to capture their ongoing insight, but also their journey and experience. We need a clear, simple and actionable measurement system that is crucial to both understand and improve patient experience. Um, in terms of that, we often have surveys that only focuses on episodes of care and miss the broader patient journey that includes the time between care episodes. So capturing the entire care journey provides deeper insights and help us better understand. For example, um, as uh, in the introduction, I'm a kidney transplant recipient. My journey started when I was diagnosed with kidney disease and then going through dialysis and then waiting uh, for my organ transplant and then had a transplant. So, and clinical trials are just one part of our patient journey. And when you try to capture in one episode of care, you often miss out on other um, aspects that can influence that episode of care as well. And then another thing that is really important is the connection between patient and staff experience, because often um, a better understanding these connections, because in a survey, it's more about talking about whether we find parking or not. It's about how the staff feel on the day as well, because often in terms of dialysis, a needling is one of the key issue. Depending on the nurse I get, my dialysis uh, experience differs. If she's angry, she might need a little faster. So it's about those to mixing the patient experience and capturing the staff experience is really important as well. And we talked about um, a national approach and a localized approach. And I think Mana and Sarah presented that uh, it is important to have both national and local surveys, but uh, because national approach provides us with the standardization and comparability, whereas the local service provides insight into what the community needs. There are community specific issues, like Sarah mentioned, a care at Brisbane site compared to a Sunshine Coast site. So what we are advocating is a hybrid model that ensures bo uh, both um, 
alignment with the national standards and relevant to the local needs as well. So, and also in terms of um, um, actionable data, uh, we need more uh, qualitative sections in the survey rather than just quantitative sections for benchmarking uh, because a lot of patient voices, patient stories are captured in those um, qualitative approach. And that's why long surveys, even though it's long, it's really important to focus on the care journey of the patient as well. And it's better to avoid duplication. Uh, and sharing the data is really important across organizations, which is really important uh, because asking patients for the same survey 10 times by not improving the care is not serving anyone. I think uh, if our goal is not just to measure, but to use those insights to foster trust and improve care coordination, I think that will build a better health experience for all. I think um, I think Sarah will add more to this one as well. Thank you so much for my time. Thank you, Shyam. Sarah, <laughs> love to hear your views. Thanks, Shyam. Um, somebody um, has put a question about um, you know, survey fatigue. And that is certainly um, an issue. And I think the key there is is where Cheyenne was at the end is um, there has to be um, something done as a result of these surveys. Um, so um, they need to bring about change. And um, <clears throat> I think it's, um, it's a lost opportunity for um, those administering clinical trials not to be asking people who are participants in the trials what their thoughts were on the trial because they're the ones who've lived it and they actually have more experience of it than those administering the trial. So it's currently um, a lost opportunity that, that sites could, um, could benefit from. Um, in terms of... Uh, you know, the validation and whether there's a national or a local. One of my concerns would be that that every medical research institute goes off and starts doing trials into doing a survey, uh, which is uh, just going to be a waste of time and resources. And um, you know, I think is a good reason why a national one would probably be a, a good way to go um, so that research can be focused on um, on, on important things, not that this isn't important, but um, I know how important to research it is that any survey that goes out is validated. Um, as a non-researcher, um, that that's not so important to me, but I know I know it's important. Um, and again, I think that validation ties back into the being able to utilize that information and and, and have that improvement cycle. Um, uh, that's probably it for me at the moment. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's okay. And and Sarah, you make you make a good point about you know not collecting the information being a lost opportunity because if you think about it, just in just about every industry, we you know collect consumer feedback, um, but we need to find a way to incorporate it in, into clinical trials. Um, and, you know, more routinely assessing that experience. So, and, and you know, and it'd be interesting to hear from um, attendees today as to how they feel and, and whether maybe there is, there is another way of, of doing this. Um, Cheyenne, you talked about um, a hybrid model approach. Do you mind elaborating a little bit on, on what you mean by that? Because I think in terms of a hybrid model, because we, we need validation, that's 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 given. Because we, we, when we try to benchmark services, it's really important to validate a tool that is um, um, a tool that is validated. But often people, when you talk about clinical trials or any research, people who are un, um, often have unmet needs, people who are underserved, people who are often missed out on clinical trials, people who experience homelessness, people who are from LGBTQIA+, people who are in prison. So how do we capture their experience in a broader national set? So that's why it's really important for the researchers 
to have a specific section that can serve that community that they are doing research for, rather than capturing, for example, if you do a survey for people um, in a survey that uh, caters for people who are um, experiencing homelessness, and if you put an address there, where do they put their addresses and capturing the social demographic status? How do you validate a questionnaire that is so now serving for already uh, male pale tail syndrome that exists in this country and treating Australia as homogenous. So the, uh, uh, accepting that heterogeneity of Australia being it rural regional area. So how do you develop a survey questionnaire that can be nationally captured, but also providing some ex um, uh, tools or uh, validated questions that can serve the underserved community and encourage them to find the gaps in it mm -hmm. and encourage them to be a part of this group discussion as well. Yeah. Um, I think that's and really would... important. Sorry, I was just going to say that yeah. because I was one of my things that I wrote down was what do we do in our cold communities? Do we, you know, and, and um, Cheyenne's right, you know, maybe they didn't make the trial, but surveying them is so important to understand why not and what didn't we do to support them. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know if Mana has that experience with what they did in the UK, but where they're up underrepresented and, you know, is part of the questionnaire um, and the survey understanding as a, as a country, well, why did we miss those? That important mm -hmm. part of the community, it's not representative. Mm. Yeah, Mana, yeah, I would love to hear your views on this. Obviously, having gone through the journey yeah. of de having developed a standardised question set, um, I'd be interested to you know, in your response to what Shine's talking about. And also after that, Sarah, it'd be great to get your views on this too, because I, I think I noted that you said your survey is focused more on site performance rather than factors that specifically are related to the actual protocol or that trial experience. Um, so maybe we'll start with you, Mena. Yeah, sure, great. Thank you so much. It's very interesting to hear all this experience and uh, your talk as well, Sarah. Um, uh, one thing, um, some of our local networks, they try to do, it's okay to say no. Um, it's basically for the participants who decided not to take part in research. A um, um, few local areas, they did that, but we didn't manage to get that, like have a, like, a standardized question set because it wasn't countered towards our like a HLO and PRES numbers. But I think this is something we need to pick up again because it's why participants, they didn't take part research. But I guess still we are missing some parts in terms of Shine's um, um, question because they are individuals who already made an effort um, to come to the site and they maybe they've been approached, but they haven't been decided, they haven't decided to take part in research. So um, I guess um, some of the things as well, it goes back to the like inclusion and exclusion criteria at the early stages. Press, it's for us, it's toward the end of their clinical journey. So if there is anything, participants are excluded at the earliest stages. There is not much you can do with press because it's just one bit, one tool at the end of the clinical research journey. So we are missing the whole thing. So I guess if we need to look at the whole research cycle and how we can make sure that we approach the wider community from the earliest stages when they come to the clinical research Press has its own limitations. I know. I don't say that it's a great. It is a great tool in a way, but it has its own limitations. What you can do with press, I guess press can inform to make those decisions and the changes at the earliest stages. At the moment in the UK, we are collecting some demographic questions. We are going to review uh, some of our demographic questions. It's a standardized um, uh, set of uh, demographic questions. It's been developed by our research inclusion team. So, and we are going to try and see what what how many of those questions basically we can include in the new updated survey and whether those uh, demographic question it makes any difference in terms of like a research experience whether a specific group they have a, like a different research experience so these are the things we are looking at it but i guess press it's very end bit of the research cycle so there is a limitation around what you can do mm. and you know de development of a survey, it's not final, is it? It's an iterative, iterative process. Sure. Things change along the way and discussions like this and feedback like this can influence, uh, um, you know, those changes. 
Yeah, one um, thing I would I would like to add is that because the research landscape is changing as well. So what we have developed five years ago, it's not may it may not be valid mm -hmm. anymore. Um, Sarah mentioned about like a short saver and long saver. That's something that we are looking at like as a pres light. If there are studies that they don't have any interaction, some of our questions is kind of redundant, so it's not going to be relevant. Mm -hmm. So how you make sure that you are asking the right question from the participants who don't have any interaction with the like a study um, site or research team so we have to be flexible mm. and just just very quickly Mana you said that the survey is actually offered to participants at the end of the trial experience does that mean that they have to have completed or finished final visit um, you, you, if someone exits the trial early because of an adverse event, is it is the survey offered to those patients? Um, can you just clarify? Yeah, we cannot be too prescriptive about when they deliver it. So we say that it should be towards the end. So enough to give enough time to the participants to have a um, an experience. So um, so it's up to the study team how they how when they want to deliver it and especially like for example because we have like a one studies they are like a multi centers they are offered at different locations so as long as we make sure that they it's like for example the fifth visit they are offered so it's it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be the last visit but give participants enough time to have uh, captured like a gathered experience so they are able to feedback something not the first visit that you don't know what you are doing so give enough time to the participants to complete press mm. mama do the do the participants who answer this the, the surveys get an aggregated feedback from press it depends to our local area we say that press is anonymous so we overall we are not collecting contact information but some of our local um area they collect contact information so when they are their local press is published they share the results with the participants mm -hmm. Sarah might hand over to you um, for your feedback and comments particularly on when you're administering the survey um, and the the nature of the questions that were decided for your survey as I said you you focus on site performance. Um, was that a conscious decision? Was that driven by the the you know what what consumers felt was appropriate? Uh, maybe if you could just elaborate on that, that would be great. And then we'll we'll on just for all the attendees and then we'll um, throw to Michelle to bring in maybe some of the questions that are sitting in the Q and A channel as well. Thanks, Christine. Yes, yeah, some really important points are being brought up here about diversity and making sure we're having reach and accessibility for different groups, um, as well capturing community versus national um, nuances and as well um, capturing uh, the qualitative uh, side of, of things. I think it's important when talking about these surveys as robust as we can be um, they have their limitations and they are they are just that surveys and they don't replace other important research that needs to happen they don't replace other consumer advisory and consumer involvement activities so for us as a site our, our and where we came from in terms of um, focusing on the site performance side our experience as a site is that we do mostly um, sponsored uh, commercially sponsored trials so when we receive a protocol, it's um, there's no consumer input at that point. Um, it is what it is, and we have to implement it as is. So for us, it's important to measure our performance based on our service delivery and not aspects that are out of our control. We believe that that consumer involvement is important and lies somewhere else. So definitely before that, protocol comes to us to be implemented as a site, there should be consumer involvement and input at that point. So, and hopefully sponsors are taking it on themselves to um, get consumer involvement at all points along their trial pipeline um, to get feedback on things like their protocol and their design. So that's where we came from in terms of um, deciding where we would focus our attention. Um, and it was consistent with what we discussed with consumer advisors in the um, in drafting the survey as well. Just reflecting on the discussion that's taken place in Manners' presentation, do you think there may be an opportunity or scope to review that? Or to maybe... I think, yeah. 
Yeah, I th I think there is. Um, I think there's lots of um, there's lots of work to do. Manu mentioned that they have adapted their survey, and forgive me if I phrase it incorrectly or represent it incorrectly, but they've adapted this, adapted their survey for um, different. Uh, disease indications, um, that's all, all for, uh, there's ones for children and you could think about um, someone's experience on an oncology trial is going to be much different to someone's experience on a healthy volunteer vaccine trial. So you've got to um, think about the cross-cultural validation for um, different trials experiences because they do vary considerably. And that's the point, Sarah, because when you mentioned that, I thought, how can you, I mean, the, the the reason for someone, a healthy volunteer going on a clinical trial is is fairly different to a patient with a, a therapeutic indication, but you put them yeah. all in the same survey, right? So you took those results. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And we'd love to do more exploratory analysis, picking apart, stratifying mm. those, um, the, the different types of participants and where they're coming from, um, that would be really interesting to see if it holds up in both um, in both areas. Um, Sarah, you've got your hand raised, and I I have too, but that's an accident. I've got to lower the got to find the function to lower the hands. Um, Sarah, please go ahead. Yes, yeah, Sarah just um, touched on something that I that I wanted to um, raise, which is that. Um, you know, when we're thinking about whether this is something that there's a national participant research experience survey on, in my mind, there's, um, you know, a research site or a clinical trial team should be communicating with the participants um, in an ongoing way throughout the life of the trial anyway. Um, and this would just be one of many, um, not necessarily surveys, but, but other ways of communicating um so um and and obviously trials are different um you know i've been on a, a, a cancer trial that that lasted two and a half years um and and another one that was sort of as a healthy person that lasted about a month um you know so that, they're all different but um i think there's there's an opportunity for sites to do their own thing as well as well as having perhaps a national uh, thing as they do um, in the UK. Um, and certainly I think it would be really nice to know what people participating in clinical trials in Australia actually think about the clinical trials. And um, we we can't really improve unless we, we get that sort of national feel as well and feedback. So I, I think there's a couple of different levels this could be done at. Um, Cheyenne, you got your hand raised. Yeah, I think we often think um, there is complex wicked problems have complex solutions. But one of the things that are easy is like if I ask 30 people who are attending today how they choose a restaurant, it's based on Google reviews or something, isn't it? A star system. If you just give that open option for people who are participating in clinical trial to just leave a review, and then that creates not only a re account accountability for those trials and the organizations that are conducting trial uh, because of the trust they built with the consumers. And they're just saying, uh, if someone puts a bad review, because these people are, as you mentioned, uh, and often you see people are, giving literally their blood and sweat altruistically for these trials and uh, they not get anything in return. But if these organizations or uh, the trials that are done, just open a, their website and then there is just a, um, or in the Google, if you Google a site and then that has reviews on it or star rating system, and that will create some change because people can talk in a public forum rather than these guarding of these results and then working on simplistic uh, on national data set or local data set, who is going to create it. It's just people will leave reviews and that creates not fear, but some sort of accountability for these trial sponsors conducting trial. That's a simple system that I, I think of from my simplistic view on this thing. It's one way of avoiding survey fatigue. Um, <clears throat> now, 
Manner, I'll, I'll go to you and then we'll definitely go next to Michelle to bring in some questions from sure. the audience. I'm going to be quick. I'm going to yeah. be quick. So no I just worries. wanted to add, so we are including free text questions. So we have two free text questions for participants to leave. Um, if they want to write a paragraph, it's open to them so they can do that. So it's not only quantitative. Um, I think it's um, where we get our rich data. Uh, from the participants. Uh, and I wanted to add, Sarah mentioned it, that um, there are different ways for participants to get in touch with research studies. So some of our local areas where they were collecting um, contact information, it was for the people who wanted to talk about more about their experience. So they were running like a one-to-one -one interview or the focus group. So I think this could be an option for the local colleagues if they want to explore more, because even if you go with the national set of questions that there is a limitation. So if you want to explore more locally, what's the experience, anything specific about your local area, that would be another avenue to explore. So because from like one-to-one mm -hmm. -one conversation, if it's about like a specific, I don't know, specialty, um, mental health studies or cancer patients or, I don't know, um, children. So you can get that rich information through having like those one-to-one -one conversation. Yeah, that was the only point I wanted to raise. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Mena. Um, Michelle, I'll just cross over to you. Are there any burning questions? There are some great questions here, actually. Thanks to um, everybody's um, participation and great questions, and there's some really good comments as well. Um, this is a question for Mana. Um, how were the survey questions developed for national standardisation? What was the process that was that was undertaken? Yeah, um, as I mentioned, we had loads of local versions going around. So at the time, we were working with uh, Picker Institute in the UK. So they are a charity expert in um, developing like a patient experience surveys. So we collected all of our local versions going around, shared it with them. They did it on our behalf. So they ran like a number of focus group. Um, so uh, yeah, so we were not involved um, in terms of uh, working with the patients group and as, as well. So we developed a question set uh, with in collaboration with Picker Institute, and it was open for consultation to our like a wider network. So they took the draft versions to the local area research delivery staff, patients and public, and we gathered the feedback uh, from them and we finalized the question set. So it was a lengthy process, I would say. Yeah, we only managed... Ask. Yeah, yes, about uh, time and how long that would take. Yeah, it was around like five census. months, five months just for the adult wow. version. So we didn't manage to go through the children versions. We do have a three children versions at the moment, but it's not been validated such as our adult version. So lengthy process, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what is the response? This is to you too, Mana. Uh, what is the response rate overall for Prez? So for each year that it's been deployed, what has been the response rate and has that changed over time? Yeah, I looked at the question. So I just managed to put our numbers together. So the last financial year, which we just published the results, uh, we had over 35,000 responses. So financial year for us starts uh, beginning of April, end of March. So for 23, 24, it was 35,000. The previous year, 22, 23, it's been 30,000 and um, 21, 22, it's been 20,000. So every year we manage to increase the number. That's fantastic. That's quite huge numbers too. I know it's the UK, but... Um, it's yeah, England. Very... It's England. So, England, yes. yes. Yeah. Um, also, this is a question um, to Mana and also to Sarah. Um, were participants in the survey re remunerated at all? So PRES, not specifically for PRES, if they were part of the clinical research study, so whatever, what was the arrangements for that study, I'm sure they've been remunerated, but not for PRES because it's just a, like a customer feedback. So it doesn't need ethical approval. So for PRES, we don't need to have ethical approval. So not for PRES. Uh, that's it's the same answer for us as well. The um, clinical trials participants are reimbursed for their time on the clinical trial, um, but for the feedback survey, um, it's uh, yes, not not requiring ethical review. Our pilot did, but not the survey, um, and not requiring reimbursement. But um, I know that 
you know, it's a strategy uh, in health services marketing and other marketing areas that um, that prizes or, or whatnot to, to get those respondent numbers up um, are offered, but um, it's not something that is sustainable from a health services marketing approach to reimburse everyone for um, for survey responses. Thank you. Um, this was um, a great question. Is it possible that such a survey could be part of the clinical trials one-stop shop build um, that makes sense to be co-located with that? Uh, what are people's comments around that? This is around the sort of the standardisation at national level and how does that occur? Sarah, Sarah's got a thumb up. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to comment first on that question? No? Okay. It just makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Shyam, do you have any views around that? I think that's a starting point. At the moment, there is nothing, which is, um, I, I always say um, something is better than nothing. But then um, at the end of the day, it's a um, they who is going to do this one? That's the end of because the national uh, one-stop shop or the clinical governance framework. Often those intentions are good, but then it becomes a tokenistic. It becomes an another tick box exercise, and we ask as a consumer share the results with us when you are publishing that um, throughout the journey, uh, whether you're doing um, at a time point or um, at the end of the. Um, research, share the results and the actionable data. What are you doing as an action so that uh, the next participant gets a better experience than the current one? And it's not just um, a, a ranking scale. It's a it's sort of like a criterion-based um, system so that people all can uh, aim for a better experience to provide for consumers rather than... Um, because they all pay much money to have a better return, recruitment rate, but the retention rates are people having stay in this um, trials or research is poor because people lose trust, people are misinformed, people are not cared for. So those are the things on a survey uh, becoming more and more a part of an improvement exercise rather than a judging exercise, yeah. Mm. So Mena, um, how is Prez supported? How is it funded? I, I think I may have heard earlier on in your um, introduction that the, the, the Department of Health was involved. Is that correct? Or So we are funded and IHR yeah. Research Delivery Network is funded by um, uh, Department of Health. We mm. are employed, our coordinating centre is employed by um University of Leeds, but our local networks, um, 12 local networks, they have their own host organizations. Um, there are certain things that we offer at the moment. So we have a press central processing. So at the coordinating center, we are paying for that. So they are a standardized, our paper copies adult version is a standardized set. So it's designed like a for the free post as well. So we are paying for that. Um, so we are working with the data processor company as well. Um, we pay for that at the coordinating center as well. Uh, but that's probably is going to change. So these are the things that we need to look at. But yeah, it is a kind of our um, current process. It is how we are supporting this. So we print that one at the national level and distribute it locally to our local area so they can pass it through different sites. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. So are there any more questions from attendees, yes. Michelle? Yes. yes, there's many more questions. Okay. Uh, one for Sarah. Um, can you expand on what is meant by patient views 12 indicators of the um, of the reputation of pharma, please? I think that was mentioned. Does that make any sense to the patient views 12 indicators? Yeah, patient, patient views 12 indicators of the reputation of pharma um, is... I think a survey in itself, but is a, a published um, media release that we looked at that had 12 points um, regarding the reputation of pharma. Obviously, some of those are relevant to clinical trials because we're doing commercially sponsored um, clinical trials. And so that was a good place to start um, to work out what do we, what are 
patient perceptions and what do we want to um, ask patients about. Thank you. Um, there's another great question around, this is around, again, the timing of um, when surveys are deployed. Um, so um, do surveys also see why potential participants decide not to go on trial? And I think this is really important that we don't just wait um, to gather the participant experience at the end of a trial. I think it should be at all stages of the trial, even when a participant's given the informed consent form to review the trial um, for potential participation. Um, and perhaps um, as a solution, there could be a survey that, that has three parts to it. So, you know, a part for um, the start of a trial, a part for the, the middle of a trial and a part for the end, which includes the complete trial. So I think um, with some of the questions that have come up, um, it's around the timing and ensuring that we're collecting the comprehensive voice, even for those participants that are screen failed or um, read the informed consent form and decide for whatever reasons um, they do not go on the trial. So any um, any comments from the panellists around that? Mm. I think that was what Cheyenne was talking about earlier and Mana touched on that as well. So, um, but if anyone else has any comments on that, I think just in the interest of time, um, we might run the, the poll again to see how sure. people views have changed before because we've only got about one minute to go and then if people are happy to stay on for a couple more questions if the if our panelists and presenters are happy then I'm happy for to extend the time but we'll run the poll very quickly again um, just to see if how views may have changed or may have not changed. So hopefully everyone can see the poll on their screen. I think we've We've stopped. So, yeah, that's interesting. So at the beginning of the session, um, there was some interest from people suggesting that cl clinical trial sites should take responsibility for developing um, their own surveys. But now no one's actually um, ticked that. Most people tend to feel that a standardised survey approach which is, is the way to go. Um, we have had some people drop out of the webinar um, that may have had to leave, so those voices aren't included, but it's just inter interesting to see that change. Mm. Um, so we'll stop sharing those results now. And, um, and yeah, like I said, uh, uh, our panellists and presenters are happy to go on for another couple of minutes um, for a few more quick questions, or if you have to run away, that's fine. We can just put a close. I know Sarah, go. you have to go. Yeah, yeah. that's that's think, completely fine. Yeah, so and I, I think most of the um, questions that are left have been addressed. Yeah. Um, okay. So good. Yes. So I think we've. Um, I think everyone. Yep. And there's some comments there too that we'll take on advisement too. Thank you. Yeah. Liz, did you have anything else you want to say before we close? No, I think it was um, it, it was excellent. And watching the questions come through in the comments, I think it's really valuable. And I completely agree with the idea of, you know, our participants and really understanding what makes them part of a trial, how they feel, start, middle, end, all, you know, and, and getting, and even for the, I think the important piece is also when people don't agree and why. Um, so, no, I think this discussion was really valuable. And, Mana, it was really interesting to hear what you've been doing in England and so not further outside of England. And, Sarah, also great to see what you've done with USC. Yeah. Congratulations. It's great. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to have further discussion if there is any outstanding question to talk about our experience. So. Wonderful. It's a great session. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much, Mana, Sarah, Shyam, and you. Sarah Lukeman and, and Liz and Fiona and Rochelle and everyone that's made the effort to attend today. I think um, you know, 
reflect, reflecting on today's conversation, I think it's the beginning of more conversation and discussion <laughs> to, to, to follow. Um, still lots of unanswered questions, but um, really good to make a start on this important conversation. So thank you to everyone that um, participated today. Wish you all a fantastic day. The webinar has been recorded, so we will be putting a version, um, uh, you know, be accessible on the website. So thank you very much for your time.